Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to our audience present here and those watching us online. Kindly pardon us for a slight delay. My name is Namrata Ganeri, and I'm a Commonwealth Rutherford Fellow here at the Center for Global Health Histories, which is also a WHO collaborating center at the University of York. Our center is a co-organizer of today's webinar, What Works? Complementary and Alternative Medicines in the Biomedical World. This webinar is the first culture and health webinar of the series uh, being run in 2020. And it is the 142nd Global Health History Seminar. We will have eight more webinars through the year covering broad themes of culture and health. The website schedule is available online, as well as past recordings, should some of you want to revisit some of the interesting themes that we cover through the year. Like today, all our panels are interdisciplinary, comprising of academics, practitioners, and policy pe persons. The next webinar will take place on 5th March on health inequalities in a digital world. The aim of the webinar series is to bring together policymakers, academics, social scientists, historians, senior officials from the WHO and the wider UN system to exchange ideas and perspectives on cultural, historical, and social aspects of health. This dialogue is essential to improve public health communities' work on this work of global health histories. This series is a collaboration between the evidence for health and well-being in context, based within the division of information, evidence, research, and innovation, the WHO Regional Office for Europe, which operates under the umbrella of European Health Information Initiative, WHO collaborating centers here at the University of York and at the University of Exeter, generously supported by the Wellcome Trust. We have a fantastic panel here today, uh, and I'll introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Dr. Vivian Lowe is a senior lecturer at University College London, and you can see her on screen. And she's the convener of the China Center for Health and Humanity. She's been teaching at UCL since 2002, and since 2015, she has been visiting professor in Peking University Health Sciences Center. Vivian's core research concerns the social and cultural origins of acupuncture, therapeutic exercise, food, and medicine. She translates and analyzes manuscript material from early and medieval China and publishes on the transmission of scientific knowledge along what is usually called the Silk Road. Her current projects include a Rutledge Handbook of Chinese Medicine and a Nutrition History in China. Our second speaker who is present here is Professor Hugh McPherson. He holds the post of Professor Emeritus in Acupuncture Research at the University of York. He trained as a practitioner in acupuncture in the early 1980s and continues to practice acupuncture at York. In 1997, he became research director at the Foundation for Research into Traditional Chinese Medicine, a base from which he launched his career into research with colleagues from the University of Sheffield. Since then, his research into acupuncture has included safety studies, practice surveys, clinical trials, reporting guidelines, which is called stricta, and systematic reviews. His clinical trials have evaluated the cost effectiveness of acupuncture for a variety of conditions, including low back pain, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and chronic neck pain. He has also conducted neuroimaging studies exploring potential mechanisms of acupuncture. He is lead editor of the book, Acupuncture Research Strategies for Building an Evidence Base, and a co-editor of The Integration of East Asian Medicine into Contemporary Healthcare both published by Elsevier. Our third speaker is, you can not see her online, but she is with us. And uh, she is joining us from Geneva. And she is a technical officer with the traditional complementary and integrative medicine team at the World Health Organization. She works 
with several external partners, including WHO collaborating centers, specializing in traditional medicine. She has 13 years of experience in Ayurveda and public health, and her research has been supported by the Norwegian Agency for Development, or NORAD. Dr. Bana holds master's degrees from the University of Glasgow, and she has tried in her research to place Ayurvedic principles within the European Union Health Promotion Indicator Development Model. Our speakers will speak for a maximum of seven minutes, following which we will invite questions from the audience present in the room, as well as those joining us online. Our online audience can ask questions using Slido, S-L-I-D-O, by searching for the hashtag W-H-O-C-H. It's an option available to people in this room as well, and we hope to take questions from both the live and uh, online audience. I also encourage you to upvote and download questions so that, no, so that we know which are the most popular questions and we can take them first. Finally, some housekeeping instructions. We've, we've passed on evaluation forms to everyone. Kindly fill them uh, after the seminar. Our online audience can also give feedback using the polls section and you could share your email with us and we could add you to the culture and health webinar emailing list. Now, I do not want to stand between our fantastic panel and the audience present here as well as those joining us online. So over to Vivian, followed by Hugh, and then Aditi. So. Yeah, okay. So um, governments uh, often have tolerated traditional medicines in under village societies because there is insufficient biomedical provision or because traditional medical practitioners with a little bit of training can uh, deliver critical primary health care. But uh, everything is changing. On the one hand, we have this uh, awful crisis of the coronavirus, um, which forces us to think, do we need a certain style of modern evidence before we advocate for traditional medicine? The Chinese government is doing uh, very uh, different. Um, so, using historical examples um, uh, from China, this presentation will suggest that there is much more to be learned from traditional medicines on their own terms. Um, why China, though, first of all? Uh, what makes a successful living tradition like the Chinese one? And one of the things that I've learned through all the years of my study is that successful living traditions have to change. They have to change to suit the contemporary environment. Um, and uh, so the plasticity, the ability to change and adapt is essential. But then, if that's the case, how can a tradition remain authentic? What connects it with the ancient world? And there are many things that we might point to here. Firstly, uh, for example, the Chinese tradition um, has a long history of, uh, the, uh, of welfare, of concern for the people at large. Um, and so here we have Mencius uh, in the Confucian tradition arguing that it is a government responsibility to provide health care, but also famine relief, uh, clothing, education, um, and um, eventually uh, treatment during epidemics, uh, for example. Then we also have um, something which might be considered equivalent to the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which is a Buddhist-inspired um, uh, text from Sun Tzu of the 8th century. Um, and uh, this also uh, inspired the medical benevolence of the Song Emperors, so very influential throughout the history of medicine in Asia. Um, but what are the key claims to authenticity and efficacy uh, of pra practitioners of Chinese medicine uh, as, um, uh, as uh, they negotiate the biomedical world? Uh, they would say that there's growing scientific evidence uh, for traditional medicine. And we're certainly going to hear from Professor McPherson about that. And this justifies continued investment and um, use of traditional medicines in the modern world. Another um, uh, claim would be that traditional medicines are an art and um, not reducible either to the active ingredients 
uh, of a remedy or to standardized treatment protocols. Um, another claim would be that it's holistic and personalized within the biopsychosocial context. It treats the patient and the community and not the disease. Uh, one of the major um, claims uh, that is made is that it's a long experiential tradition, that it is empirical. Um, and this is enshrined in the myth and legend of the culture hero Shennon, the divine farmer. Um, and it is said that he tasted all the uh, Chinese herbs and foods in one day and uh, with them for their, their fragrances and their powers. Um, and so here is enshrined the idea that the doctor is altruistic and that he will, um, he will uh, jeopardize himself for the good of the people. Um, and that he found out the knowledge of the virtues and foods and drugs. And mostly I'm going to leave this angle to uh, Professor McPherson, but, uh, but also um, the sound bites from that argument concern the millennia long experience of drugs, of drug discovery and development and the selflessness of traditional doctors. Let's look very briefly at that. So um, for example, there are strong potent drugs in the Chinese Materia Medica. Um, which, uh, such as, for example, uh, those that have been um, observed y y um, affecting animals, and in particular, you can look at the aphrodisiac um, history here. So, uh, for example, yin yang huo, um, this herb called a uh, horny goat's weed, uh, was observed to be uh, an aphrodisiac for goats and sheep. And so it began to be used uh, for human beings, and we know now that it has mild um, Sidnafel in it, the active ingredient of Viagra. Similarly, um, we now, uh, I'm sure all of us know, the history of Qinghao, of artemisinin, uh, uh, which has become a uh, antifebrile uh, disease, uh, sorry, uh, for treating antifebrile diseases in the ancient world, and now the drug of choice for preventing malaria. Um, this um, was uh, um, discovered during the 1960s and 70s in the Cultural Revolution, in Mao's Cultural Revolution, developed by the Nobel Prize winning Tu Yo uh, who, who isolated with her team the active ingredient from the plant extract, uh, purified and uh, identified its chemical structure. This is now um, a well known and a drug of choice. Um, then there is um, the uses of, for example, uh, saltpeter, where in medieval times um, it was shown already um, uh, uh, that it was also useful in the treatment of heart disease, and this is something that has only been discovered in the modern world very recently. Um, so we know that there are strong, powerful medicines. Others, medicines tonics and medicines like ginger and red dates are much more like uh, 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 foods and foodstuffs and so locate healing within the domestic environment, within the homestead, and I think that's another important angle. Uh, but really, uh, for me, more, even more important than the uh, powerful drugs that one could discover, uh, the hundreds of powerful drugs that one could discover by bioprospecting in the ancient texts, is that medicine... Um, uh, traditional medicines have been used and almost symbolize uh, medicine as an art, the personalized medicine that has been lost um, through the re reductionism of uh, what is perceived um, uh, as biomedicine. So traditional medicine has come to signify this lost art of medicine at a time when everything is being standardized, uh, the skill of the doctor um, is being uh, devalued, um, and it's also being used to... Uh, how um, uh, medicines, uh, traditional medicine can be uh, used in uh, personalized medicine, individualized medicine, um, and strongly associated with community and self-care, um, individualized suffering, social medicine, and environmentalism, so holism of that kind. Um, to just, just to show you one example, a couple of examples before I finish, um, that um, uh, the art of drug combination is absolutely key to traditional Chinese medicines. So rather than using simples, compound remedies are what's important. Um, and this undermines the search for a single um, active ingredient. In fact, modern uh, pharmacological research is really not up to the claims that are made by traditional medicines. So uh, for example, I think you have some slides there that 
uh, indicate um, how, how a, a remedy, a traditional remedy would be changed for an individual and then at every single consultation it would change again. Now, if you're looking for the active ingredient, it's a syn it has a synergistic effect and nobody's going to fund that. It's impossible to fund because it would take so much time. So we have this big question, do we have to wait for the evidence to advocate for traditional medicines if that evidence um, is rather limited and the methods for finding it are rather limited? So um, in the art of treatment, the art of medicine then um, in, in a traditional sense means there is a combination of different treatments, a holistic approach to health combining, for example, different forms of exercise, dietary therapy, massage, heat treatments, acupuncture, a treatment that embraces individual physical, emotional and spiritual experiences of health and disease. Um, and so I think the last um, uh, um, slides there, you have uh, an ancient 200 BC a picture of uh, a therapeutic. This is uh, my personal um, uh, research, um, my great joy. And here, thereafter, uh, a couple of slides which uh, talk about the social determinants of health, whereby um, it describes how rich people get, get sick because they get too emotional and poor people get sick because of their labours. Well, that is clearly true. But what's and the very last slide you have there is a picture of how that has been uh, re-expressed within a uh, post-communist state that uh, this exercise, and in this case, Tai Chi Chen, is uh, great for the health of all. And um, that's basically the sound bites of what I'd like to say today. Thank you very much.
So um, I'll present, um, this is just the outline of my presentation. I'll start with a brief overview of the global situation and trends uh, based on the Global Report on Traditional and um, Complementary Medicine 2019, which was uh, published by WHO last year. This will be followed by, um, I'll give you a brief uh, introduction to the WHO Traditional Medicine Strategy 2014-2023 and its implementation. And the way forward, what um, WHO's perspective is and what uh, our unit, the TCI unit, Traditional Complementary and Integrated Medicine Unit at um, headquarters, what work we are engaged in currently and our plans for future. So um, the report uh, that was published last year, the WHO Global um, Report on Traditional and Complementary Medicine, based on contribution of 179 WHO member states of the 194 member states, uh, we saw that in um, the use of traditional complementary medicine was acknowledged by 170 of the 194, which is actually 88% of the member states of um, uh, WHO. The national policy, it shows a progressive trend. The national policy um, that's on traditional medicine that's been there in uh, member states has increased. The number of member states that have national policy has increased from 25, which was in 1999, to 98 in 2018. The National Offices for Traditional Complementary Medicine was reported that as of 2018, 55% of all member states have a presence of a national office for traditional and complementary medicine. This report um, is available on our website and you can download it and you could see detail because we also have country profiles at the last part of the report. With respect to regulation of herbal medicines, um, the report shows again a progressive trend and as of 2018, we had 124 member states that 64% having regulation on herbal medicines laws as well as regulation for herbal medicines and which is uh, quite an increase from 65, which was in 1999, to the present 124 and 2018. And 78 member states reported having regulations on traditional complementary providers as of 2018, and was 67 in 2012. So again, there is a progressive trend in that. The report, um, also shows that we had asked member states about what do they face as, as, as a challenge and where would they want uh, WHO to support them. And from the responses that we received, uh, lack of research data was um, something that was highlighted by most of the member states who responded to the surveys uh, on the basis of which this report was prepared and lack of financial support for research on traditional and complementary medicine was the next uh, difficulty and challenge that they were facing. Um, that is a, a brief overview. And now, what we are, uh, our main focus, our, um, all our efforts of traditional complementary medicine unit and, and integrated medicine unit here at headquarters is focused on implementing the WHO traditional medicine strategy 2014-2023. And uh, this actually came into being or came into existence um, after the WHA resolution on traditional medicine 2009, which spoke of updating the 2002-2005 strategy. And um, if you see that soon after the strategy, there was another resolution on traditional medicine, which again, like the strategy, spoke of um, focusing on policy safety um, quality of traditional and complementary medicine, information exchange, training research. And then slowly, as it kept moving, there were things that were added. In the Beijing Declaration, it spoke on policy, safety, regulation, research, innovation. And by the time 2019, resolution um, of 2009 uh, said, um, asked member states to adopt the Beijing Declaration and also asked WHO to update the traditional medicine strategy. And that's how then the strategy was developed. The strategy has two main goals. 
first being harnessing the potential contribution of traditional complementary medicine to uh, health, wellness, people-centered healthcare, and UHC. The second one is promoting safe and effective use of TNCM through regulation, research, and integration of the three Ps of TNCM. The three Ps meaning products, practice, practices, and practitioners into health system as appropriate. These two goals um, have to achieve these two goals, we have three strategic objectives. The first being um, building knowledge base for management through policies. Second is strengthening quality assurance, safety for proper use and effectiveness by regulation. And the third being promoting UHC by integrating traditional complementary medicine. Under each strategic objective, there are two strategic actions. And these strategic actions then have um, actions recommended or suggested, not recommended, suggested for member states, for partners, as well as for WHO. So it's um, a very comprehensive uh, strategy which explains how member states can uh, help in implementing the strategy and how partners could help in implementing the strategy. The 2014 resolution, um, soon after this uh, strategy, it was to the Director General of WHO to facilitate member states, support them in implementing the WHO strategy in formulation of knowledge-based national policy standards and regulation and strengthening national capacity and providing policy guidance to member states on how to integrate TNCM and providing technical guidance and ensuring safety, quality and effectiveness of uh, TNCM services. So uh, even uh, when you see that um, from a policy perspective in WHO itself, uh, from the uh, strategy that was there in 2002-2005, there has been uh, some aspects that have been um, added and the scope of work for traditional medicine in WHO has also increased and also expanded, looking at how member states are working with traditional and complementary medicine. And from 2014 onwards, um, after the strategy was developed and implementation started, we uh, had these key uh, resolutions and declarations. In 2016, we had this one that um, is on integrated people-centered care. And it spoke about integrating traditional complementary medicine into health systems for a holistic approach to health. Uh, the Shanghai Declaration, India, uh, said that traditional complementary medicine could improve health outcomes, including um, sustainable development goals. In 2018, we had uh, the declaration of STANA on primary health care, uh, in which traditional knowledge was, uh, it was um, it mentioned that traditional knowledge could be used to improve health outcomes and also to use traditional medicine to uh, extend the access to services. And last year, 2019, uh, in the resolution on uh, patient safety, the global action on patient safety. It, uh, it mentions, it asks uh, member states to consider traditional complementary medicine for safer health care. We also have a chapter on traditional medicine in, the, um, 11, in ICD-11. And the United Nations General Assembly political declaration um, of the high level meeting on UHC last year it has a point that says, to integrate safe and evidence-based traditional complementary services, especially at primary health care level. So yes, um, you see that uh, not just the WHO, but even the UN, and we have a, an International Day for Yoga that is also traditional medicine. Um, so UN also recognizes um, and acknowledges um, the role that traditional uh, complementary and integrated medicine play. Uh, our unit, um, our, our, the main mission of our unit is to promote and support effective use and equitable access to quality TCI products and health services that are safe, integrated, people-centered across the life course and care continuum through research, regulation, and appropriate integration of product practices and practitioners into health systems, health, and well-being. And here we are working with uh, in areas of medic uh, medication safety, self-care, ICD-11, rehabilitative care, 
palliative care, elderly care, PHC, and even indigenous medicine. So um, this is how um, our unit is working. And our future uh, uh, next uh, work plan also has these aspects included. Our ongoing current activities are um, So we have um, global coordination of the WHO IRCH network, which is the International Regulatory Cooperation for Herbal Medicines. We have 35 members that are uh, national level agencies from countries. We have 23 collaborating centers for traditional medicine. We have an expert advisory panel. We have official relations with um, non-governmental, non-state actors. And also, we provide uh, technical support to strengthen the research base which is uh, building a knowledge platform and clinical evidence database that's all under our global uh, leadership approach. And uh, now, as per the general program of work, 13th general program of work of WHO, we're also uh, looking at making global goods, which are technical documents that are supporting um, proper, appropriate integration of t uh, traditional and complementary medicine, where we have standard terminologies. We have the WHO International Herbal Pharmacopoeia work on which we've started. Then we have uh, guidelines on herbal medicines, benchmarks for practice, and training practitioners in various interventions, promoting integration, uh, reviewing existing models of integration, monitoring global trends. This report last year that was published is one, one of those um, products. And digital health tools for consumer education and self-care, uh, like M-Yoga. This is another thing that's uh, uh, coming up. And we also support countries, priority countries identified under the umbrella of UHC and other through our regional offices if they have identified any countries. We hold international training workshops in Macau and any other country that requires ad hoc support. And they request WHO for support. Our unit works at supporting them. And um, just to control what is WHO's perspective, uh, these are the words of our Director General, Dr. Tedros, that countries aiming to integrate the best of traditional, complementary, and conventional medicine would do well to look not only at the differences, but also look at areas where both converge to help tackle the unique health challenges of the 21st century. And in an ideal world, traditional medicine would be an option offered by a well-functioning, people-centered health system that balances curated services with preventive care. Thank you.